Hey everyone, this is part six of my trip to Papua New Guinea. If you haven't seen all the previous episodes, I made a playlist on YouTube so you can find them all in one place. The last episode, I went to see the Asaro Modman tribe and it finished with the helicopter guys dropping me off at the airport in Goroka. My next destination is Rabal, which is down on another island of Papua New Guinea. But there are no direct flights between these little towns, so you have to take a flight back to Port Moresby and then from Port Moresby to Rabau. The thing is that you can't do this in one day because all the flights are delayed by a lot of hours or cancelled and they don't even tell you anything. So I had to book it for one day and then travel the next day and I slept one night in a hotel in Port Moresby. I was going to Rabaul because there's gonna be a mask festival, which means a lot of tribes will travel to that place to show their cultures. It's not just the mask festival why you want to visit Rabaul. It's also a very significant place for World War II. And also there's a lot of tourists coming in who do diving because there's World War II shipwrecks really close to Rabaul coast and people coming in for diving. Rabau is sat between a few active volcanoes and the whole area is considered to be one of the most active in the world. So in 1994, the volcano eruption destroyed Rabau and they had to move the airport to the other side. So the airport is actually closer to Kokopo town, but it's still called Rabau. So there's 15 kilometers between the airport and Kokopo. Then there is another 28 kilometers between Kokopo and Rabau. Last night in the hotel I had internet so I could book accommodation in Kokopo and I found some backpacker place. So I booked that and then when I was on the airport I met this German tourist called Manfred and he also had accommodation booked in there. So we jumped in the car together with some locals and they drove us to Kokopo. It's just this gravel road surrounded by palm trees. So they got us to the accommodation. The buildings are really low and everything's made for so it stands through earthquakes because they are quite frequent in this area. And I had my own room, it looked comfortable, my own bed. There are mosquito nets on all the windows because mosquitoes are really bad in this area. So I get quite scared later on. Um, and you just need to make sure you don't stay outside after dark, which is quite difficult. I know I still have the whole afternoon left, so I walked back to Kokopo, I jumped on a bus which goes to Rabau, and I asked the driver if he can drop me off somewhere close to the Japanese tunnels. So I just jumped off somewhere in the middle of this road, there is no bus stop, there is no one, and I'm just looking for some holes in the ground, literally. Because what this is, there should be more than 500 kilometers of tunnels dug into this volcanic soil, somewhere in these hills. So I can see two tunnels on the left side, but it's covered in bushes and you can see that people don't really walk in there. So I keep walking towards Rabau and some car stopped and it's this Australian guy who's asking me what I'm doing. So I said, I'm looking for these tunnels and he's like, oh, I'm looking for them as well. So I actually jumped in a car with him and we just drove really slowly on this road looking left because I thought, well, I've already seen these two tunnels. There must be more. And then there was a place to park and actually like a footpath going to the left, like up the hill into the jungle. So we just parked in there and suddenly there was this local guy sat on the rock and he was just like probably looking for visitors. So, so we asked him if, if we are in the right place, if we can see some tunnels. And he literally gave us a, like a guided tour. So Rabat was a very strategic harbour in World War II and it was major Japanese base. So what happened is as the war turned against Japan, they started to be bombarded from the air. So there's more than 20,000 bombs estimated to be dropped on Rabaul at the time. But somehow these Japanese survived. And this is how. This whole network of tunnels was built by hand because it's this special volcanic soil. You can dig into it and it's not going to collapse. So most of it is not supported. There are only a few places where there is a bit of concrete. Um, every entrance is actually completely camouflaged and then some places are a little bit supported by palm trunks but 90% of the whole complex is completely unsupported and you can still see the marks from the picks and motoks and the people who worked on it were not mainly Japanese actually it was labor from, it was soldiers which were captured in Malaysia, China and Singapore by the Japanese before and they were bringing them in and they were working for them. 
And most of these people died through some disease. Like we still need to think about the mosquitoes and all sorts of diseases they had at the time. So they just used them for digging tunnels and then basically most of them died. The Japanese would have their own headquarters in these tunnels. They also had hospitals in there. They had like a multi-storied chambers with staircases, everything dug by hand. They had warehouses where they kept their spare ammunition, uh, spare parts for planes, for boats. It, it's absolutely massive complex of chambers. There are small holes dug into the walls everywhere and they used it for oil lamps and they used coconut oil so they could at least see something, but the ventilation was really bad. Some of the tunnels would have observation holes so you could actually see the harbour and you would be completely camouflaged. At the moment there are thousands of bats in these tunnels and there's just their shit everywhere. <laughs> and then there are rats, there are snakes and weird insect everywhere. And then there are these massive holes at the bottom of it where they would keep their barges, ships and planes and also a submarine tunnels. So that would be maybe 200 meters from the coast and they would use these rails to get a whole ship and hide it in this hill. It was amazing to see that, but at the same time, it was so terrifying thinking that these people were just hiding in there for years during the war. So I was quite happy to just get out of there. <laughs> I have another great idea. I was thinking maybe I can actually walk on top of the volcano. So I just get the Australian guy to drop me off in Rabau and I just start walking on my own direction out of Rabau basically towards the volcanoes, but just like thinking maybe I can meet some locals who will who will maybe take me up there or show me around. So there's just this one road and it pretty much ends uh, in, in like 500 meters. So I had to sort of turn right and follow sort of like the coast. And then I just took one of the single lanes which goes towards the coast. It's some sort of a private property, but I didn't really care at the time. There was nobody around and I just went through there and suddenly there's this harbour with a lot of shipwrecks from World War II. Everything's like rusted away, rotten, all sharp edges and a lot of bits on, on, the, on the pile. Then there's another ship, there's somebody like fishing on it, just like locals with either flip-flops or no shoes walking on these racks, completely rusted. And like it's, you know, then just like you get, if you cut yourself, you can get seriously ill. But they don't care because it's like part of the the town. It's just that, and it's always been there. And and then there's I keep walking on this black sand, which is all of obviously the volcanic ash. And there's some kids playing on their own, just naked, like really small kids. I uh, don't know where their mom was, or they're just there playing. And I can see the volcanoes, but I just can't see anybody who would sort of tell me anything about it. And I just keep walking through some private properties, like close to the coast. I can see like a rusted piece of tank <laughs> just in, in the grass. Uh, that was a bit crazy. And a few buildings around and everything's like really rusted and, and rotten. Then I walk back to Rabaul town and suddenly there is this parade happening. So there's a lot of cars coming with all these banners on it. And it's sort of like a beginning of the mask festival. But there are no tourists around. It's just the locals and the people on the trucks with all these signs and like a commercial thing. Then there's like a guy from the tribe actually sat on one of the car. So I'm a bit confused, but I didn't even know about it. So I don't think tourists who actually came for the mask festival, which is happening or starting tomorrow, I don't think they even knew about this. So it was a bit funny. Then I get approached by another 50 year old Australian guy who is working in the bank and living in Rabaul and has got one of these cars in the convoy. So he's asking what I'm doing there. I give him my number and he's telling me that he can help me if I need anything. So I got this contact thinking this guy seems all right. So, uh, but he was a little bit overly too interested. So I'm always careful with these. So then he's gone f for that time. And then I managed to meet another local guy who was just talking to me with really good English. And I was telling him that I would like to go up to the volcano if it's possible. And he, he said, actually, he can take me up there. So it's this local guy who speaks good English and he's actually taking people up to the volcano. So that was quite random how I actually met this guy on the markets in Rabau. 
And so I got his contact as well. And we organized a trip for tomorrow that I'm going to be able to walk up to the volcano. So I'm quite pleased with this. I jump on the bus coming back to Kokopo. And as, I'm, as I come home, I start getting these messages from this fucking Australian guy messaging me if I could come to his place. So obviously I'm like, I'm not coming to your place. And then another, another like just getting bombarded with messages that I should come to his place in a bikini and like do, do something. I'm like, oh my God, these Australians, what's wrong with them? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. In the next episode, I will go to the volcano, which actually erupted three weeks after I left Papua New Guinea. So click here if you want to see the previous episode where I went to see the Asaromodvan tribe and click here if you want to see the volcano trip, which I'll upload as soon as I finish it. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.